All right, let's bring him in. Jeff Patterson of Rinkwide Vancouver. And of course, Canucks Army. Jeff, how? Oh, look at that backdrop. Look at that new backdrop, shiny new backdrop. Mm. Uh, nice full screen, Grady. I like that. That is beautiful. Rinkwide Vancouver Canucks Army. Looking good, Jeff. I really like that. Yeah, did a little uh, interior decorating over the Easter long weekend and uh, came up with this. So a bit of a, a new look, but uh, I like it as well. Uh, I have to make sure that I don't wear navy so that I blend right into the backdrop. But, uh, uh, you know, that's all, some fashion choices that will be required before these big Canucks combo hits. Hey, I got to say, and I'm glad to hear that talk it humored you on the net front because low-key, one of my favorite moments from this season was when you tried to throw the PB&J line at talk it <laughs> and... Like, I don't think he had any idea what the hell you were talking about. And he just kind of stared at you and was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And then we just <laughs> all carried on with the scrum. But yeah, PBJ didn't, uh, the line didn't stick together. The name didn't stick. And Talkit had no time for your question about PBJ. He laughed. He laughed. He laughed. It was I a still bit don't of an think, uncomfortable laugh. Yeah, I don't think he got the reference, though. Like, I, I'm sure he understands a PBJ sandwich, but I don't think, like, Phil and Brock and J yeah, <laughs> PB and Jane. <laughs> well, one of these days he's going to laugh at one of my jokes. One of these days, Jeff. Uh, okay. T about the game on Sunday. One mm. guy that we haven't talked about yet. Archer Seelovs in net. We didn't talk about him at all. What'd you make of his game? And I know we're starting with the backup to the backup goaltender, but I, I thought Seelovs played really well on Sunday against Anaheim. Yeah. I think anytime any guy's thrown into a situation like that, a first NHL action in over a year, uh, as dumb as it sounds, like stop the first one. Like, you know, if the first one somehow gets in past you, then nervous energy in the building. Teammates are probably wondering, is this guy going to stop a shot? These are the Ducks. They had played the day before. This was four and six for them. They haven't scored more than three goals in a game, but once in their last 15 outings, they don't score. And so, uh, you know, for him, it was just like, this was a good fit. Like it was the right time to Smith had had a nice run, but early start, no morning skate, all that kind of stuff, like takes a starting goaltender perhaps out of his rhythm. Uh, you know, for Arthur Silovs, I'm sure he had a little bit of notice that this was going to be his game. And I thought he settled in nicely. Uh, the Canucks were not good for the first five minutes. Again, given that the Ducks had played the day before and got smoked by the Oilers, uh, I thought the Canucks might jump all over them. They didn't. And Silovs had to make a couple of stops. And so, uh, you know, the Canucks then get the power play going. They score the two. They're up 2 nothing. Should have been home and cooled out, and yet they invite this low-scoring Anaheim team back in in the third period. And when it's 2-2, like, Arthur Silas was forced to make some saves to keep the Canucks in the game, as crazy as that sounds. So, yeah, I mean, sharp angle shot by Zellweger, uh, but Phil Hironik uh, clearly uh, running a screen in front of his goaltender. So tough for Silas there. He talked about it after the game, said, yeah, just you didn't see that. And then, uh, now I have to pick a little bit of a bone with you here, Dave. Did I hear you say that JT Miller's not going to make mistakes in the playoffs? Did I get that right? Not like that. He completely lost his man. He's not going to make a mistake like that. All right. Hold this clip, Grady. <laughs> um, anyways, whatever the case, like, sure. Uh, you know, and I think it's important, too, that they get still loves the game. He hadn't played anywhere since March the 9th. That was the night that Demko went down. He had played in the American Hockey League. But then, really, almost three weeks of sitting, waiting for an opportunity and I think he'll get the Arizona start. And so something to build off baseline of facing NHL shooters. You know, he talked about having a good long stretch of practice with Ian Clark and video work and all that kind of stuff. But none of that replaces uh, live ammunition of the best shooters in the NHL, even if they are the Anaheim Ducks. So, uh, yeah, all around, I thought Silovs held up his end of the bargain. I thought the team in front of him had to play a little bit better. But ultimately, guys, it's a win. You take the two points. You don't do a whole lot of critiquing. And you move on knowing that there are going to be a lot bigger challenges, including this one tonight in Vegas. Uh, Jay Pat, pivoting away from the game a little bit, how do you view the month of March as a whole for, for the Canucks? What's your assessment, takeaways, and what do you want to see over the remainder of these regular season games to ensure that the team is peaking heading into the playoffs? Yeah, I agree with your assessment, Harm. Like, you have to see it as a success. Have they played their best hockey? Uh, certainly not offensively. Has the power play been an issue? Yes, it has. They've gone 12 games. 12 games at this time of the year where they have not allowed more than three in regulation. Colorado got a fourth on the power play in overtime. But you got to go back to that 5-1 thumping by the LA Kings at home on February 29th. That was the last time the Canucks gave up more than three in regulation. So they are dialed in defensively. Uh, I guess my concern is you look at who they beat and you said you got to take care of the weak teams. And they did that. 
but outright losses to the Kings, to the Dallas Stars, and the overtime loss to the Colorado Avalanche. Now, no blowouts, as you said, no absolute duds, but the game against the Kings when they were down in the third period and one shot in the first 15 minutes, they, you know, there were stretches. I, I guess that's you know, my concern is there have been stretches in a lot of these games where you would like to see more. Is it maybe too much to expect them to play 60 minutes of perfect hockey? Probably. But when I think of, you know, a few of the teams that got the late second period goals that got them back into games like Colorado, uh, you know, the Washington game of the nine on the homestand, that's one that they, if they play it 10 times, they probably win eight. But that night, Charlie Lindgren was good. He's been good for the Capitals for a while now. And the Canucks just couldn't muster anything in the way of offense. So they're not scoring a lot of goals, but they are not giving up anything right now. And so I think that's an encouraging sign for me is if they can continue to lock things down, you get Thatcher Demko back, you're going to be in almost every game. And then it's a question of, you know, if it's tied in the third period, can they muster the offense needed? You don't have to win five to one playoff time. You just got to get one more than the opponent, even if it takes overtime. So there's a lot to like about the way that they are playing, getting Dakota Joshua back obviously is huge. Connor Garland playing some of the best hockey that he's probably ever played in the NHL uh, right now. And I like the idea of that line with, you know, we like that line with Teddy Bluger. And now you've supercharged it by putting JT Miller in the middle of those guys. So, you know, there's some things to like there. I guess I wonder a little bit about Elias Pettersson. Didn't have a great homestand. Had the big night against Buffalo. And I think everybody was hoping that maybe he had turned a corner. Uh, He had a one-shot attempt. And it was on the power play in the first period against the Ducks. You know, like I was looking at this earlier today. His most frequent opponents on Anaheim the other day, Jackson Lacombe, uh, Gustav Lindstrom, and Leo Carlson. Those were the three guys that EP40 played against the most on Sunday. So it wasn't like he was out there shadowing Frank Rotano around the ice. Uh, There wasn't a whole lot uh, worth shadowing on Anaheim. But, you know, that's where you want to see one of your best, most dynamic players take over and leave the ducks in his dust. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I wrote about this at Canucks Army that, you know, everybody's kind of waiting. There's time here, but man, you'd feel better if he could ramp up the production. And I thought it was fascinating, guys. Uh, I don't know if you watched Rick Tockett's uh, post-morning skate uh, video from Vegas this morning. He was asked about getting Pedersen going. And he said, you know, he's got Hoaglander's 22 goals. He's got Besser now, 38 goals. There were 60 goals on his wing. And it was essentially like, we're giving him the best scores this team has to offer. It is go time for Elias Pettersson to start making some things happen. So, uh, again, there's runway left, but he's got to make it happen. He can't ask. It's not He's not dragging Ilya Mikheyev around the ice anymore. Uh, he's getting a chance to play with their most productive goal scorers this season. Uh, I want to see a little bit of offense uh, from Elias Pettersson. When we talk about this team perhaps wanting a little bit more offense out of them since the All-Star break, how 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 much of that is just Patterson? Like, if he gets going all of a sudden, does that automatically solve the entire team's offensive sort of, um, I don't want to call them struggles, but, or, or the point I'm trying to, the question I'm trying to ask is, is there more than just Pedersen to get this team back on track offensively, or is it just getting him going and everything falls into place? Well, I want to see what they look like when he is going. Cause we saw in January, he was one of the stars of the month in the national hockey league and, you know, playing with lotto line, but he's playing with two thirds of lotto line here and Hoaglander's having a great season. Uh, you know, it's there. We know it. We've seen it. We saw those first 10 games of the season where he was, you know, one of the best, like, he had a 15-point lead on Connor McDavid at one point this season in the in the scoring race. That uh, was way back then. Uh, not anymore. But, you know, he had a burst out of the gate, and then he had the big January. Otherwise, there have been these lulls. And that's why I want to believe that there is still an act left in Elias Pettersson this season to be at or near the top of his game. It would go a long way. But I think it's fair to also question the depth scoring because there will be some nights where top-end guys cancel out in the playoffs, and then you're left with that group of, you know, McKayev and... Lafferty and Di Giuseppe if he's in there and poor Teddy Bluger who hasn't scored since the game after Christmas against Philadelphia and and has had all kinds of chances and kind of wonder if you know so if it's a 2-2 tie and all the top players are canceling each other out you know sometimes everybody said oh maybe it's a power play I think it can go the other way and sometimes you know can you squeeze a little bit of offense in some of those tight games out of your bottom six or even your defense and Uh, I do have some questions. I don't know if they're concerns, but I think questions that are left unanceded uh, about the like Pod Colson. You know, if he's going to play in the playoffs, like 
if you're in uniform, in my mind, I'm not expecting you to score every night, but you have to be the possibility of being a game breaker. Sometimes you need those. You know, everybody's talking about unsung heroes right now. Uh, come playoff time, sometimes those guys can step up and be the difference maker. And I don't know. I don't know about you guys. Like, do you have confidence that any of those guys that I just listed off is going to sort of break through and be the guy uh, in a tight playoff game? That's a great point. And I mean, it's kind of the conversation we were having early on in today's show was that, yeah, I like the look of the top six, the loaded up top six. It looked better, but you need something from that bottom six. And again, it becomes a lot more complicated uh, if you are, in fact, without Elias Lindholm. Hopefully they get him back at some point here. Jeff, so many different directions that we could take this. Uh, you brought up the unsung hero. So I'll ask you that. Who is this team's unsung hero this season? Well, I joked on Twitter because I responded to the Canucks Army post that for me, it's Quinn Hughes across the board. And that wasn't just an ease of filling out a ballot. I, I won't fill out a ballot. It's a fan voting thing. But like, honestly, somebody responded and said, you know what? Like, I wouldn't bat an eye if Quinn Hughes <laughs> swept the awards. Like, honestly, most exciting player. I think I could make a strong argument that Quinn Hughes has been that guy. Best defenseman, of course. Most valuable. He's got my vote there. And I, like, there are a lot of nights where I leave the rink and I think we don't talk enough about Quinn Hughes <laughs> and at the price point for three more years, a 90-point defenseman. So I'm going to sit here and make a case for Quinn Hughes as being unsung uh, in that regard, just against, you know, dollar value against point production. Uh, he won't win the unsung hero, but uh, unsung hero is such a weird one in a market like this where every player's story is written a thousand times throughout the year. Um, you know, I think early on, Casey DeSmith was the unsung hero. Uh, Ian Cole uh, you know, Phil DiGiuseppe coming out of training camp and, and earning a spot in the top six. So that has obviously faded. Um, but I, I see the strong wave of support for Connor Garland. And yet it feels like he's been the most talked about guy at the start of the year for some reasons. And obviously he's flipped the script now. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's why I'll leave that one to the fans and I'll be surprised when they hand out the year end awards on the 16th of April in the home finale against the Calgary Flames. But, you know, without a doubt in my mind, Quinn Hughes has been the MVP. I just think that, uh, uh, has leveled up and tilts the ice so much for the Vancouver Canucks. As great as JT Miller has been this year and as good as Thatcher Demko was in the early going, uh, I just think consistently from start to finish and taking on the added responsibility of being the captain, uh, to me, there's just not much doubt that, that Quinn Hughes has been the MVP. I love it. Uh, you could also make a case, and I think I think he'll get it. I think he will. The Henrik and Daniel Sedin Leadership Award, like community leadership. I think Quinn Hughes has to be considered for that one. Uh, and most three-star selection, I don't know that. I don't know if you keep a tally, Jeff. I know we have the three-star segment in rink-wide. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there's a way to just Google quickly who is the most three-star selection, but someone's keeping track, and the Canucks will hand out those awards uh, when Calgary visits on the 16th of April. Okay, Jeff, I had one more question for you, and I, I, we're going to wrap up here, but I have one more question for you. Uh, about the game, Nikita Zadorov. Healthy scratch, load management. We've seen Ian Colby load managed and all that sort of stuff. Surprise you at all that we saw Zadorov a healthy scratch on Sunday? No, I think Rick Tocchet had tipped us off that he said that we might be surprised with uh, sort of how deep that load management goes. I think for me, uh, it was interesting. After practice on Monday, they practiced in Vancouver and then flew to Vegas. And Tocchet was asked, will Zadorov, will Zadorov get back in? And he was willing to say yes the day before a game. And then... Somebody asked who's coming out, and he said, oh, we haven't made that decision yet. Again, this morning, optional, so we didn't see pairs out there skating. Uh, I know Zadorov took the option. Uh, uh, to me, guys, an opponent like Vegas and a possible playoff preview, I think we can read into whoever goes as the top six tonight or the six defensemen, a pretty good indication in the eyes of the coaching staff that this might be the way they line up in game one. And I'm not convinced that Noah Juleson's going to be the healthy scratch. Tockett didn't declare who the scratch was, so we're going to have to wait until warm-up. I do wonder if Ian Cole is going to be the guy that that sits here. Uh, it's uh, Juleson's 27th birthday, so it would kind of suck for him to have to sit out a game. But uh, So that's something to watch heading into this game. Uh, obviously, with back-to-backs, I think we'll see some load management in Arizona on Wednesday. So I would be surprised if it's the same six that go in both of these games. Uh, and the other thing to watch, too, just based on the events of the last couple of days, Brock Besser is going to play tonight, but I'm curious to see, uh, you know, if there's any sort of discernible thing that is slowing him down in any way. I know speed's not uh, his strong suit, but left practice, that was curious. He participated for about 15 minutes at Monday's practice and then left 
wasn't available after the game on Sunday when he scored against the Ducks. We asked for him in the media, and he we were told he was in treatment then. We were told he was in treatment after practice yesterday. Uh, I was encouraged to see him taking the optional this morning, so he was out there, got a twirl in. But you don't get that much treatment if you're not playing through something. And I know a lot of guys are at this stage of the year, but just keep an eye on Brock Besser and his availability and sort of, uh, uh, you know, does he look like the normal Brock Besser? And, you know, he's in, within two of 40 now, so I'm sure he wants to play every game that he can to try to get those two goals that he needs to, to reach the 40-goal mark. Jeff, great stuff as always. Thanks so much for doing this. People can find you and Irf on Gafar. I asked beforehand today, uh, yes. you and Irf, post-game tonight. <laughs> I, I knew who my co-host was, yes. Yeah, so, hey, that's progress. I had done my homework. I was able to answer. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, Irf will be in studio. and uh, uh, It's getting good, guys. Eight to go and then the playoffs. So uh, we're ramp ramping things up on rink-wide, uh, as I know you are in Canucks Convo, and uh, you can start to feel it. So big one tonight, uh, big road trip, and let's see how they respond to uh, – uh, what I'm sure will be a pretty good test at the hands of the Vegas Golden Knights. Good stuff, Jeff. Thanks so much for doing this. All right, guys. Thanks. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.